If you're an instructional designer or you're thinking about becoming an instructional designer, then it's a good idea to know how much money instructional designers make. In this video, we'll look at data from a variety of different instructional design reports, and hopefully this information will help you know your worth or just get a better idea of what to expect when you're entering the instructional design job market. So let's dive into it. So I see this question a lot, especially from newer instructional designers, and they're wondering what kind of salaries to expect in full-time roles, as well as what kind of rates to charge for freelance opportunities. So we're going to dive into the data, the reports, and I'll also share some of my own experience from freelancing. But keep in mind, this is not financial advice. If you think that you're worth more than these averages, that is completely up to you charge more, or if you wanna charge less than these averages just to get your foot in the door and get out of you know, whatever career you may be coming from, that is completely up to you as well. So these are just averages and some of this is from my experience, but let's dive into it and look at the numbers. So quick overview, we will be looking at my instructional design report I conducted this year in 2021. We will look at this US Bureau of Labor and Statistics data, or US Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, we'll also look at the Learning Guild report from 2018. This is referenced quite a lot. And I'll also share um, my freelance experience earnings from 2018 to 2020. So pretty good variety of data. Let's start off with this report. So this one is live on my website. If you want to check it out, I'll show you here. So this is the report. It's called Instructional Designer Full Report 2021, and you can see it is quite long. So I'm just gonna share some quick overview statistics, but there are graphs and charts, and there's some global data. This will focus a bit on the US side of things. So in the USA, the total compensation, and this compiles data from freelancers, full-time employees, and people who are full-time employees with freelance work on the side, the average total compensation out of all of those people is around eighty-five and a half thousand dollars. So around eighty-five grand. Um, if we're looking at only salary, I think it's around like eighty-one grand or so for full-time employees. And then the total compensation worldwide, if we're excluding the USA, is around seventy thousand dollars. So 70.6k there. And this is data from six hundred and fifteen respondents. It is pretty corporate heavy, and it is leaning more towards people who are newer to the industry. So check out the full report. I'll link all of these, these reports and links in the description. So if you want to explore the data more closely or see what it is for different countries, you are able to do so. And again, this data is from 2021. So this is the most recent data uh, in, that we have in this video. Next, we'll take a look at this Department of Labor Statistics data. So when I was getting into the field a few years ago, I saw people cite this a lot. The only issue with this is that this is salary data for instructional coordinators. And I don't think that's the same thing as an instructional designer. So let's take a look at this together. Here we are on BLS.gov. And we can see, yeah, this is data for an instructional coordinator. It says the median pay is around 67 grand per year. But if we look at what instructional coordinators do, it says that they oversee school curriculums and teaching standards. Okay, so this is, seems very K-12 like education centered, and that's not what a lot of instructional designers are doing. It says they develop instructional material, implement it, and assess its effectiveness. That sounds like an instructional designer. But then again, if we look down into uh, the work environment, most instructional coordinators work in elementary and secondary schools, colleges, professional schools, educational support services for governments. So not exactly what we are dealing with, right? A lot of us are working in corporate instructional design positions. So I think that probably has to do with why the salary is quite a bit lower. And hopefully the Department of Labor Statistics will have uh, a listing for instructional designers at some point in the future. So you can check this out, but keep in mind, it's not exactly instructional design. You will probably see this reference though. And then of the largest report, uh, the Learning Guild report from 2018. So it's a few years old now, but you can see pretty healthy salary numbers even back in 2018. There is a full report on their site, which I will link in the comments if you wanna dig deeper into these numbers. But right, this is the data from 3,300 respondents, and this is just salary data. So the average salary 
according to this report for IDs in the US is around 84 grand. Okay, so pretty close to my findings in 2021. Uh, something else I'll keep in mind, right? These are averages, these are medians, uh, but don't think that it means just because you're coming into the field with no formal instructional design experience that you're gonna be starting out much lower than that. Everyone I help in the boot camp and people who I talk to have landed roles from this channel and from my content. Uh, the people with solid portfolios are are landing above these, these medium pays. They're landing close to or above six figure corporate instructional design roles. And people who are freelancing are, are doing better than these averages as well. So you don't need formal ID experience. It will help if you have been doing some instructional design work in the roles you've already held, because you can position that as instructional design experience, but you can, you can land these type of salaries or even much higher, honestly, um, just landing your first instructional design role. You don't need to start at like 60 or 50 or something like that. Some people do start in the sixties or seventies. Um, and that's completely okay as well. Just wanted to give some perspective on that. It's not absolutely required to have formal experience. And there's videos about that on this channel. I do have a video about how to land an ID role without experience. So go ahead and um, check that out if you haven't seen it already. Now let's chat about my freelance experience. Um, let's get into the freelance rates. So in 2018, I was a full-time master's student working two part-time jobs. So I wasn't able to freelance full-time at first, but towards the end of the year, like around August or so, that's when I graduated from my master's program and transitioned into freelancing full-time. And it was quite busy that last four months. So over the course of the year, I tried to average it out and say, uh, we were probably spending about 15 to 20 hours a week on client work. And my wife, my girlfriend at the time, also helped out a bit because like I said, I was a full-time master's student, two part-time jobs, building my portfolio and doing client work. So it was it was nice having my wife's help throughout this experience just to yeah share some insight there. But we were able to make close to 60K that year. So a pretty good start to the freelance business that last four months of 2018. Um, 2019. This year was kind of a nightmare just because of how busy it was, but we did make close to 200 grand and averaging out the hours we spent on client work, this is a total of 35 to 45 hours a week. So about a full-time workload, but this doesn't account for the time I spent uh, creating content or, you know, just on the, on, well, it, it does count the time I was like on calls with clients, but there was just some other stuff that goes into figuring out freelancing that probably added on some hours here, but Pretty, pretty solid year. I realized after that I wanted to focus more on, on content. Like 2019 is when I posted my full guide to becoming an ID. And in 2020, I started focusing more on YouTube and video work. And I made, we made less total sales overall, but I was spending five to 15 hours a, a week on client work. A lot of weeks I was spending no hours on client work. Um, at this time I was only taking on really like high budget, small projects that I can get done relatively quickly without a huge time commitment. Because again, I, I was committed to creating the content and I didn't realize it when I was creating the content for free, I thought it would just help me land clients. But at the end of 2020, I was able to start to offer a paid program for other instructional designers. And that leads me into 2021. I stopped taking on clients um, earlier this year, but you could do some math here on like hourly rates. We're going to talk about those next, but just wanted to give you an idea of what my past few years have looked like on the freelancing front. I was blown away by this. I thought I was going to have to work full time for a couple of years, making like I was hoping to make like 80 grand a year working full time. And as you can see, we surpassed that quite a bit. Um, so a lot of opportunity in the freelance space, just like there is on the full time side of things. And I think my portfolio is what really helped keep the clients coming in. Uh, so let's talk hourly rates. People ask about that quite a bit. Uh, and again, these are just estimates. These are not, you know, hard rules you need to follow. You're free to do what you like, but talking to people and, um, going through it myself, this is, this is what I've seen. So to start. 45 to $60 an hour is general, pretty safe range. Um, I did my very first project. It was kind of as an intern in grad school for $45 an hour. That was the only project that I did at that price point. I did a few at $50 an hour. And then 
for that first year, all of the rest of my projects were at $60 an hour. So I started off charging hourly. Um, I found people with a bit more experience and a strong portfolio. They can secure closer to 65 to the $100 an hour range. See a lot of people do 75. Um, but yeah, really across that whole range. And then there are people who have been doing it for years who are still charging $60 an hour, but they're busy pretty consistently and they're happy with that. So again, just general estimates. And then if you are pretty specialized or you do have a good differentiator, like you have really good customer service skills or yeah, you can do like some really nice motion graphics work. Um, that's great for a, an instructional design setting. You may be able to charge higher rates that are much higher than, than market rates. The real joy though is project pricing. And at the end of 2019 or early 2020, I, I stopped doing hourly projects. Um, I only did one or two hourly projects above $100 an hour and it was because I had really fast turnaround times, really good rapport with the end client and they decided to pay me, I think it was like 125 or so, um, just because they knew they could count on me to get this stuff done and they needed those fast turnarounds and that good customer service. So paying that higher rate was a safer choice for them than you know, working with, trying to find someone else who could deliver at that same pace and at that same level of quality. So keep that in mind for if you do want to charge that hourly rate, but if you want to make more per hour, like what I would suggest if you have some experience is to transition to project pricing. That's where you scope out a project really well. You and the client get on the same page about what will be, what will be included. You outline the review cycle and, and make sure it's clear that if something goes beyond uh, the scope, the client will be paying for it. But if you can handle all of that and it does take some getting used to, you could earn four figures per hour, uh, with some of these project price projects. I think pretty much every project I worked on in 2020, if I were to put an hourly rate on it, it would be mid to high three figures or low four figures. Uh, because again, I was charging per project. It would be 20, 25, 15 grand for a project. And then it'd take me 40 hours or so to complete the project. Um, so you could do the math on that. But when I did do the math, it was always working out pretty nicely. And if I were to tell a client, oh yeah, my hourly rate is a thousand dollars, nobody is going to go for that. <laughs> um, but if it's a nice clean number and you, you have a process that's pretty ironed out, you can obviously work efficiently and you get rewarded for your efficiency with project pricing. Happy to chat more about that. Feel free to ask any comments about, or any questions about this in the comments. But yeah, uh, if you are trying to become an instructional designer, probably the good next step would be to check out my full become an instructional designer playlist. I do have a single video that is quite popular that helps people become IDs, but there's a full playlist to back that up. And many, many people who are, support this channel have gone through that playlist and landed their first ID role. And then of course, if this did help you, it, I would really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. Happy to answer questions about any of the stuff we discussed in this video. And if you do want to see a follow up video about any of this, again, just feel free to let me know in the comments. So thank you for making it to the end and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.